happy football, everybody. Happy Sunday. We're back. We're back with you. Sigmund Bloom, Dr. Gene Bramble, a uh, special guest for as many times as we can uh, afford it. He's expensive. Mitch Carl yeah. from Rise or Fall, uh, DFS uh, Nuggets here. And uh, we'll be joined momentarily by Jason Wood because, well, there's nobody at the Eagles game. It's in Washington this week anyway. So we get the great joy of Jason Wood soon. Let's jump right in, though, because we get Mitch for about 20 minutes, Dr. Gene. So um, I'm saving the Philly game for when Jason's here. Let's start with Mike Evans and Tampa uh, coming down here to New Orleans, breaking up those tailgates. Don't tailgate, folks. Just tailgate at the safety of your home. Uh, But what about the safety of Mike Evans in your lineup, Gene? I'm not particularly enthused about Evans today. I think we went from 48 hours ago, the Bucks were doubtful either shortly before or after practice to him being upgraded and now potentially going to be active in play. And ordinarily in these situations, we've talked about him so often over the years, you look for a player to be vol- involved in some high leverage snaps because you know he's not going to play every down. And when we've talked about Calvin Johnson or Rob Gronkowski or, I mean, the list goes on and on, those are the primary options in the offense. And this is not saying that Mike Evans is a small potato in any way. But when you're talking about high leverage options for Tom Brady on the Bucks today, Rob Gronkowski, Chris Godwin, we've seen the Bucks and Bruce Arians use Cameron Brait around the goal line. There's no guarantee that even Mike Evans at 6'5", 200, whatever, is going to get every high leverage target. And a player that only gets you know 20 to 30 snaps is going to get six to eight targets or two to three red zone targets and still be able to be productive for you. I, this is a situation, I don't like to use the word decoy, but if Evans is on the field and he is not full strength, it is really hard to see him winning often enough for Brady to want to target him over some of those other options, including a guy like Gronkowski that we know he's comfortable with. Okay, Mitch, is there an angle here to play with Evans, a decoy, maybe a little more, maybe a little less? Uh, What about the background of Tampa, New Orleans as a potential shootout? This is uncharted territory, two quarterbacks over 40 starting week one. Yeah, this is a really interesting situation. I was kind of excited about the prospect of Mike Evans being out this week because I was dialing up Justin Watson, and I had a I had a feeling that he was going to be out there kind of getting those maybe tertiary targets behind Gronkowski, and I was actually most excited for Gronk himself if Mike Evans, you know, that big frame in the red zone was not going to be there, in which case I was going to be all over Gronkowski. And whether that meant I was going to stack him with Tom Brady, that was likely going to be some type of stacking scenario involved in the game, whether that was Drew Brees to Michael Thomas running it back with Rob Gronkowski so that I could have a game stack for DFS purposes. But now that Mike Evans is in there, you know, potentially in maybe the Millie maker, you're throwing him out there for a dart or two, hoping that, you know, he catches a touchdown or two in the red zone and and you're just gobbling up some red zone targets. But ideally, I think this actually might not be a bad thing. And, I you know, I know this might not be a, a, a hot take or whatever, but uh, I like the fact that he might be out there, decoy or not, even if that just takes a little attention away from Chris Godwin, who I'm very excited about this week. And I think that, you know, if Godwin's running out of the slot, even just for a percentage of the snaps, which he did last year, if he's doing that this week, that could be a very, very, very lucrative spot to uh, target this week in DFS. And uh, Chris Godwin is going to be a very popular pick this week. And Mike Evans being in or out makes no impact on how much I like or dislike using him in DFS. A big reveal on Tampa's offense in general with the Evans injury complicating things. More two tight ends, more three receivers. Does Godwin get slot snaps? Uh, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson. I didn't even notice the being there angle on Chauncey Gardner. If you don't know what I'm talking about, look it up. Uh, th- so that's interesting because people talking about P.J. Williams being banged up in the slot. Actually, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, I think, is going to get more slot snaps there. Remember, they got the Jack Rabbit and Marshawn Lattimore. Some people thinking maybe the biggest development with Mike Evans being out there is that he'll cancel out Lattimore, also helping Godwin. Uh, so lots of – real quick, Mitch, any angles on the New Orleans side you like? Or is this one where maybe we need to respect the Tampa defense? Oh, no, I actually I absolutely love this game. So I went back and looked at some of the Millie Maker winners over the last two years, 2018 and 2019 on DraftKings and quarterbacks that were in the top five projected game totals ended up being in a Millie Maker winning lineup 76 percent of the time. So you have two quarterbacks right now who are involved in a, a 
potentially a shootout or at least some type of high scoring affair. There'll be three to four touchdowns per side as what Vegas is saying. And I think you're going to need some exposure to both sides of this game. And I don't know if that means you have to have some Tom Brady exposure. If you just want to focus on Drew Brees with maybe the higher floor and ceiling combination, you can do that. And then you can get your exposure on the Tampa side of the offense by having them on the opposite side of your stacks. What that means is if you're using Drew Brees and on DraftKings this week or FanDuel, wherever it might be, you are then trotting out a wide receiver like Michael Thomas and using somebody on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to run it back on the other side of your stack. So you could have Drew Brees, Michael Thomas, Rob Gronkowski, Drew Brees, Michael Thomas, and Chris Godwin. Or vice versa, Tom Brady, Chris Godwin, and then have Michael Thomas on the other side. But I definitely am going to get exposure there. It's it's hard not to with that Vegas implied total. Gene, Mike Williams, he's not not expected to play. Expected to play. Uh, what is the outlook for him this week going forward in this confusion? It's week one for me too. I'm never sure whether I'm on <laughs> mute or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think probably what happened was that that Williams, they weren't really sure, and then he felt a little bit better through the weekend than they expected. It's a little bit odd for Adam Schefter to reverse course after an overnight tweet. He doesn't usually put those out there unless he's got pretty strong indication that what he's reporting is going to be accurate. So um, for that to happen, and then we saw Ian Rappaport say, well, there's a chance, and then Schefter was even more definitive than that by saying he's going to play. The difficulty with these situations is when you've got a shoulder injury that you're not sure about, it's been multiple weeks, they hadn't cleared him for contact, only limited practice, and then not sure going into the weekend, you really don't know whether or not some extra padding and pain management is going to be enough to allow him to withstand hits, withstand being taken to the ground, and the range of motion that's necessary to catch passes, especially his particular style of play. Also, you're dealing with a new quarterback in Tyrod Taylor. The Bengals secondary is struggling a little bit through injury, so there's a lot of unknowns here. Is a situation where you could see him get to his usual targets that you would have expected with Phillip Rivers last year, possibly. Maybe Tyrod Taylor leans on him a little bit more heavily, but there are other options in the Chargers office, similar to what we discussed with Tampa Bay. And you could see a situation where, you know, an, an unexpected hit from an unexpected angle ended his day a little bit early. I think maybe you have to consider Mike Williams in play a little bit just because there's so many other uncertain wide receiver situations today, but I wouldn't be optimistic that he's got any sort of ceiling expectation. Welcome to the show, the one and only Jason Wood. Welcome, Jason. Uh, and before I toss it to Jason, Mitch, are, are we uh, getting frisky thinking about Chargers pass game options with the possibility of Mike Williams at least being limited again, a decoy? Or is this one where we want to watch, gather data, and maybe take a chance on Tyrod Taylor and his targets next week? That's an excellent, excellent phrasing of the question. And I think this week is kind of one of those days where you're just gathering data. Uh, you know, Tyrod Taylor coming into this season has had just one 300-yard passing game in his entire career. He has thrown multiple touchdowns, just 13 out of 46 starts in his career, and he has a 4% touchdown rate. These are not numbers that, uh, you know, scream play me in DFS. You know, there, there will be weeks, I assume, that he's going to, you know, carry the ball 60, 70 yards, maybe pound in a touchdown somehow with his legs, in which case he provides value. But until we kind of see how this offense gels together without Philip Rivers, for the first time in over a decade, it's going to be really, really interesting to see what happens with some of these dynamic pieces they have on offense. Hunter Henry and Keenan Allen and Austin Eckler, all three of them, I'm a little nervous about for DFS purposes this week. Okay, Jason, I was waiting for you to do the uh, the Eagles take. Really, it's the Boston Scott take this week. <laughs> welcome. And by the way, folks asking, is Wildman okay? Wildman's on assignment. And, and we hope that uh, you know, we can eventually get him back. We're still going to have him on the Thursday night show uh, for the Sunday mornings. But uh, Jason, Boston Scott, um, it, you know, is, is, should people be stampeding to him in DFS, stampeding to figure out a way to shoehorn him into the lineup, or are we underestimating Corey Clement? Uh, first, before I talk about that, I need to marvel at the uh, the handsomeness of the freshly shorn Dr. Gene Bramble. I haven't seen you without right. facial hair, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. Every time we see him, the baby face. <laughs> Seriously, it looks like he's 25. Look at you. Yeah, um, yeah so Boston Scott, uh, a couple things. One, on the DS DFS front, actually, I think it's just the opposite. I think you have to fade him now. Um, you know, our, our DFS team has him estimated at just under 40% ownership. And that's just, that's way too chalky 
for a guy that very well could could do next to nothing. Um, I mean, I wouldn't be averse to playing him in redraft, especially if you drafted him with the express idea of backing up Miles Sanders because he was hurt. So, um, but I, you know, I I don't as as the resident Eagles fan, I don't know why we can, we're going to presume that Boston Scott's going to have a great day. Um, if if the Washington football team has a strength, it is their defensive front. Um, so theoretically, they should be able to stop the run far better than they can defend the pass. Now, again, this is all the- this is all theory, as you know. Sig predicting the strength right. of opposing defenses going into the year is always kind of a fool's errand. We like to think we're good at it, and we're not. But um, yeah, so I'm fine with Scott if you're desperate. Although, again, this is week one, so I would hope you're not desperate um, in a redraft league. But um, I view him more as like a flex in redraft, and I would I would fade him hard in in DFS. Just in general, Jason, what about the larger story of two starters and maybe three with Lane Johnson, like you said, against that Washington defensive line? Some people might be looking at Jalen Rager. You might be looking at Deshaun Jackson. Uh, How do you expect the Eagles to try to, I don't want to say attack Washington's defense, because if they do that, then it might be Carson Wentz under attack. Sure. Well, uh, we have potentially, well, we have at least six intended starters out this week uh, on both sides of the ball combined. So that's not a good look, surely. But we are fortunate that we get to play Washington, who I see is probably one of the three or four worst teams in football this year. Um, So I still expect the Eagles to do reasonably well moving the ball this week. Uh, You know, last year, obviously, everyone knows that we had one of the worst receiving cores of the last five years. And uh, the team was still pretty effective as a passing unit, uh, especially against mediocre to subpar opposing defenses. So I think it will be a Wednesday. Um, I think that uh, his injury was very minor. They, they were just keeping kid gloves on him. So uh, I'm sure Gene has maybe already talked about, or he did on Thursday, the fact that Jalen Rager is back is an incredibly pleasant surprise. I wouldn't play Rager this week because I just don't know whether he's going to be a decoy, whether he's one bad hit away from being out for a long period of time. But as a fan, I'm very encouraged to see that he is uh, going to be on the field in week one. Um, sometimes it's just as simple as, as, as the consensus view is correct, which is to say I think Wentz and Ertz and Goddard and D- Deshaun Jackson are all strong plays this week. I, I, I just I see them having relatively strong games with um, you know not a lot of reason to argue against that. And Kendall Fuller's out for Washington. You know, you yeah, got, uh, Fabian mm-hmm. Moreau, Jimmy Moreland, Mitch. Boston Scott's maybe the most important player in DFS this week. I.e., do you play him or do you not? Is the real cheap hit at running back of the week in this game, but not Boston Scott? Is it Antonio Gibson? Yeah, that's an interesting one. I think now that we're starting to have some value open up with Boston Scott, Antonio Gibson, and James Robinson over there on Jacksonville, that we have a lot of very cheap running backs who I think all are going to be pretty volatile. And I like what Jason had mentioned about the ownership aspect with Boston Scott. And, you know, currently I'm looking at Boston Scott mostly on FanDuel because of his very, very low price tag. And, you know, I'm hoping to some extent that we see at least what we saw last year from Boston Scott, where, you know, worst case scenario, even over the last seven weeks of the season after uh, Howard went down, that uh, Jordan Howard went down with the shoulder injury. You know, Boston Scott had 13 or more touches in three out of the six games he played in, and that was as a reserve role for Miles Sanders. And now he's potentially stepping into the starting role. Uh, Corey Clement is a decent running back, too, by the way, and I think the coaching staff likes him. I can see some type of timeshare where maybe it's 60 to 40, 70 to 30 type split. I'm hoping for the pass catching opportunities. And really what I'm just hoping is that Boston Scott gets that goal lane plunge, some type of red zone option. Jason already talked about how poor the Washington defense, or excuse me, the Washington team might be this year. And if that means there's going to be a, you know, a burn the clock opportunity in the second half and Boston Scott and Corey Clement are getting to hammer the ball down the uh, tired Redskins throat, maybe because the defense is on the field. I just like the opportunity of using Boston Scott to score touchdowns. Now in, uh, on the Washington side, I think Antonio Gibson is an interesting, interesting choice for DraftKings, specifically because of his pass catching opportunities. But that's about it for me. So who, because you know, I only got you for four minutes at the most. When you're putting together your lineups, I'm talking GPP. I'm talking you know Millie Maker. Like you want to take it down. Who's your preferred cheap running back this week? 
Okay, so if we're talking FanDuel, I'm actually starting to really like James Robinson. I like that as the pivot off of the chalkier Boston Scott. And if we're on DraftKings and we're playing the Millie Maker this week, uh, it's it's hard not to go with Antonio Gibson and James Robinson down there. Boston Scott is actually up there. I believe he's 4.8K on DraftKings. It's not yeah. like he's super cheap or exciting. You know, I'll you know give me the nice pivot to Tariq Cohen at, I believe, 4.9K. And there's some other options in there. Uh, you know, uh, one of them, uh, Cream Hunt, I believe he's mm -hmm. low 5.2K. That's a fantastic option and a positive game flow, probably. You know, if they're down 10, 14 points in the second half, he's going to be out there for the lion's share of uh, offensive snaps over Nick Chubb. And I would imagine that those are very, very solid pivots in a Millie Maker when, like Jason Wood had mentioned, Boston Scott's ownership is going to be uh, through the roof. Okay, Gene, Miles Sanders. We've gotten reassurance after reassurance, precautionary. He's going to be good for week one. He's not good for week one. He's not even traveling with the team. Is the shark move here to get Miles Sanders in a moment of panic from someone that can't play him after drafting him in the first round or maybe early second? Or is the shark move here uh, to trade him because it's worse than we thought and it, he, we wouldn't have even taken him in the top two rounds if we had known this during drafts? I don't know how you trade him. I think you invested too much in to panic before you even see whether he takes the field or not. I, my, I, I tweeted this morning, my spidey senses are tingling a little bit. Uh, you know, the injury was originally reported on August 19th. There's been pretty uniform consistency. In, in, and these are good beat writers saying that they're reassured about Sanders' progress and that they expected him to play this week. Um, and it's not just, you know, going on Doug Peterson's day-to-day, week-to-week and, and and trying to figure that out a little bit. I think there's good reason to think that that this was a little bit of a surprising outcome. And it may be what Jason has said, which is that, you know, and others have said, which is, this, you know, they're just not expecting to need Sanders today. So why take the risk? But it's been a month now. They did allow him to go through limited practices for now going on two and a half weeks. You would think that he would have been conditioned enough to play. So there's at least a, an inkling in the back of your mind that this could be an aggravation. We know that aggravated injuries tend to be at least as concerning, if not more so, than the original injury. So we may not know until after today's game, maybe Monday's press conference, even into Wednesday's practice report, exactly where Sanders stands. But there really hasn't been any indication that there was a significant an aggravation where he had a midweek practice downgrade and we're not going to see him practice next week. And this turns into, I don't know what we're going to get from Sanders until week four, or week five. And unless you see Corey Clement or Boston Scott really force themselves into a larger role than expected, whenever Sanders comes back, I think you're going to get the player that you expected when you drafted him. So I would not panic to what's happened from Wednesday to Sunday this week, and we'll reevaluate next week and make a better decision then. Okay. Let's turn the page to, uh, Indianapolis and Jacksonville, Jason, how frisky are you getting with Jonathan Taylor? Is this a, a week when even though you didn't draft Marlon Mack to be a starter, you still start him because he's going to get that veteran deference? We do expect Indianapolis to roll this week. Who's your pick in the Colts backfield? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I'm a fan of, of Jonathan Taylor this year. Um, probably overly optimistic um, that he's going to just take the ball and become the, the workhorse. But but I think that that those of those of the have crafted a narrative that in week one you give the veteran his chance uh, against what should be a relatively easy matchup, considering that the Jaguars were uh, the front office was allergic to any talented defensive front players yeah. this year and jettisoned them all. Um, yeah, I, I get. I don't happen to own either in a lot of leagues, but if I were leaning one way or the other, I would feel absolutely fine starting Mac this week. And as you alluded, Sig, I would expect that if you're going to get a lot of value out of Mac, it's going to be early in the season. Um, Taylor, I, I would assume you drafted Taylor as your third running back. That, if based on ADP, I'm assuming unless you went like a zero RB. If you went zero RB, you're starting Jonathan Taylor this week. There's no question. But uh, if he is your third running back, I, I would probably look to uh, keep him on the bench just to see if we're right about Mac getting the first shot. Because if Mac does get the first shot, I think he'll look good this week, right? So then he may get the shot in week two. But um, I don't know. It just feels like, I think I said this when we were on the couch, it just feels like at some point very early in the season, Jonathan Taylor is going to get a game script where they're thinking, all right, let's give Mac 15, 20 touches and Taylor 5 to 10 and see what happens. And what Taylor does with those 5 to 10 is going to make them say, oh, you know what? He needs to get the 15 to 20 going forward. So uh, it could be this week. I wouldn't be at all surprised. But if I had the choice, I'd probably keep Taylor on the bench this week. It's the classic, be happy if they go off on your bench in, in, in week right. one. Uh, win-win. Mitch, I just got you for a couple more minutes. So favorite, well, it, it, 
first on the indie running back any strong and lean or do you just stay away because of the uncertainty Great question. I actually love Jonathan Taylor this week on FanDuel at 5.4K because of the touchdown equity. I think he's going to get some opportunities today. Just how Jason had alluded to the potential for this to be, you know, a little bit of an easier game for the Colts. I think there's an opportunity here where they can try to give him an opportunity to get into the flow of the offense. You know, they didn't get preseason activity and we saw how Clyde Edwards Hilaire, they really started to feature him down the second half of that game as they had the ball game under control. And then he really, really started to get cooking. I think that is, you know, the, that's, uh, that's, Likely the best case scenario. We see something like that. But I do think there's opportunity here for Jonathan Taylor at 5.4K on yeah. a touch on a site where you know you're just hoping for touchdowns at that half point PPR scoring. I love Jonathan Taylor for FanDuel. Yeah. I think he's gonna be a really good pick for those large tournaments that you were also gonna ask about. He's he's gonna be a little bit lower owned, probably single digit ownership. And you know, if we're looking at multiple touchdowns, that that could be the play of the day. Doing the Derrick Henry uh, light, well, not so much a light, just because he's not going to get touches early. Uh, and, and it might be as cheap as he is all year, uh, mm -hmm. depending on what happens. Okay, before we usher you out, real quick, uh, cheap wide receivers. There's a lot. I know the two that I like are Brian Edwards and Miles Boykin this week. Who do you like, Mitch? Cheap wide receivers. Let me pull up my uh, sheet real quick. One of them actually is going to be a, a decent uh, stacking opportunity here is Marvin Hall. Because if we see that Kenny Galladay is out this week, and you know, we're talking Millie Makers today, right? right? So we're talking going against hundreds of thousands of people. You have yourself an opportunity to grab Marvin Hall as potentially the second wide receiver in Detroit today. You know, I do understand he's going to be behind TJ Hawkinson and the pecking order as well. And probably even some of those running backs that that stable of running backs in Detroit. That's going to be frustrating. But Marvin Hall, you know, he's a burner. And if mm -hmm. he can get over the top just one time, you're looking at a guy, maybe two, three receptions, 70, 80 yards and a touchdown at 3.9K and 1% ownership. I think that is a potential type of Millie Maker winning play. And we'll give your review on real quickly. But here's my thinking. Um, if Dante Jackson is on rugs, then it's uh, Edwards is going to get I'm not even sure who's uh, Rasul Douglas. Jason's going to nod when I say Rasul Douglas. You want the guy Rasul Douglas is on? Is he just joined the team? Uh, and then uh, it, with respect to Boykin, it's if Denzel Ward is on Marquise Brown. What do you think of the process behind these picks? Terrence Mitchell, by the way, would be the starter for uh, Cleveland. Yeah, that's to, for me. It's uh, I'm having a lot of problems with you were. I'm sorry. I thought that one was for Jason. No, you were talking about uh, the Raiders. Edwards. Well, the Edwards and, and Boykin because of the matchups, hoping right, that right, they get right. the weaker corner. Yeah. So I do like Derek Carr a little bit today. Um, I think that actually might be one of those sneaky kind of scoring games there mm -hmm. uh, against Carolina. And I think there's some stacking opportunity there. But for me, I don't know who to target. And I think yeah. I'm pretty much just going to go with, uh, you know, the safest target in that offense, which would be the tight end, uh, right. Darren Waller. So for me, it's Darren Waller and Derek Carr. If I'm going to do that stack outside of that, I really have a tough time uh, identifying who's going to be the wide receiver to, to uh, get those, the lion's share of targets at the wide receiver position. Maybe none of them do. Maybe it is Darren Waller as the de facto number one target. And Josh Jacob was running over fools. Okay. Mitch <laughs> Carl folks, you know him DFS and donuts and next week, bring the donuts. All right. You got it, man. You um, got it. I'll rise or fall. Check, check everything out that he is doing. Some fantastic stuff. All the sports. You were doing Korean baseball earlier this year, right? Yeah, we were. Yeah, all we were doing Korean baseball. It was an interesting time. All of the sports. Thank you, Mitch, for your precious time on a Sunday morning, the first Sunday morning of the year. And while Dr. Gene is on official business, then uh, we will uh, just be me and you, Woodrow. Um, so going back to what I was saying. It's like we're back on the couch. Yeah, exactly. It's, it, it's, it's good. It's good to spend some time together. R real quick, I can go nostalgic now. I didn't want to take up time uh, you know, flowing because when we started this show on uh, Sunday mornings, I liked it because I remember as a kid, Sunday morning pregame shows were a big deal. A big, big deal. In fact, even just choosing whether you're watching the CBS or the NBC, mm -hmm. you know, whether you're watching Jimmy the Greek and Phyllis George and Brent Musburger, or, uh, you know, when you remember Sunday morning pregame shows in, in, in the 80s, uh, is there anything that pops into your head? Well, you just said it. Musburger was my guy. I yeah. Mean, that was my dude. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, but honestly, for me, like the heyday of being a sports news fan was when ESPN was at its peak. And when I think about Sunday 
countdown. I go a little a little later than that when we're talking sure. about NFL countdown on ESPN and when Berman was was in the main chair. That was that was it, man. Like when 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 that crew was doing their thing, I that was must watch TV. It was the same thing for you know I would tune in every Sunday to that, and I would watch Sports Center or record Sports Center on a VCR. Kids look up what a VCR is. Yeah. Um, to uh, you know when it was Eisen, it's like you know Eisen's been at NFL Network for so long now. People probably forget that he was. You know, he and Stuart Scott were my favorite tandem um, after Patrick and Olbermann left. So, yeah, I mean, that for, for me, it's it's ESPN when I think of of, of Sunday countdown shows. That's that's that was synonymous with, uh, you know, I, I miss those days when I was so excited to watch that. Yeah. Well, and also um, the, the post game show. Look, it was cool to like Chris Berman. Chris Berman was actually enjoyable at one point. I know that he's become a little more of a the joke as his uh, career went on. Dr. Gene is back. But first, Jason, real quick, Rasul Douglas joining the Panthers, whether it is Edwards or Ruggs, maybe I'm getting a, a little too cute trying to project the matchup here. Um, you, you know, well, I don't remember that they did the Eagles take him like second round, third round. They liked him as a long corner. Uh, yeah. So let, let's talk Vegas, Carolina in general, and if there's a, a Vegas receiver that you like with Rasul Douglas out there on an island. Um, I mean, I, I agree with uh, the the context of the last segment, which is that, uh, you know, Las Vegas has got so many new pieces, right? Two rookie receivers on the outside starting. So um, I would be reluctant to, like, pound the table on anything. For me, um, when I was doing my first cash lineup for DFS, like early this week, I had Brian Edwards as my cheap punt because I wanted to go cheap somewhere other than running back because it seems like everybody's going to go cheap with, as we talked about, other Boston Scott or James Robinson. But then I got cold feet, and now my main cash lineup this week on FanDuel has got Darren Waller in it. So that's my piece as well. I feel like he's the one sure thing. You know, people forget. It's it's funny, Sig. Um, when I when I now kind of decompress, we're just finished the, the preseason gauntlet, which was for yeah. us five months. And I think about this narrative where Mark Andrews was the consensus tight end to take if he didn't get Kelsey or Kittle, right? And then I feel like a lot of people were of the mind that even though they had Waller ranked high, they weren't excited to draft him. And I I, just, I struggle with that because from my vantage, Waller is the one with the tons of targets, with the 80-plus catch opportunity set, with the 1,000-yard season. And the only reason that he wasn't at the top of the ranks is because he didn't catch a ton of touchdowns. Whereas Andrews was... 45% of the Baltimore snaps, relatively low reception total, and a ridiculous number of touchdowns. So if I'm going into the season thinking which one is more likely to repeat an elite year, it's Waller. I mean, Waller's because touchdowns are volatile. Um, so I feel great about him this year. I, I think he's like in the last week of drafting when I had six drafts, I, I, Waller was my target. He, he became my primary tight end target. So very much excited for him. Of the rookie receivers in Oakland, I've got Oakland listen to me of Las Vegas. I, yeah. I I like the idea of Brian Edwards going crazy this week just because everybody expects Henry Ruggs to go crazy. So and for and again, all we know for sure is that both had great camps according to the beat writers, and that both earned starting jobs. Now, yes, Brian Edwards only earned a starting job because Tyra Williams got hurt, but they both are gonna be out there on the first snap. And who's to say? that uh, because of defensive coverage and whatnot, uh, who's to say that uh, Edwards is going to be the guy with the with the better opportunity set? I'm excited to watch it, though. It's actually, I I, I think in May, I was totally uninterested in the, in the Raiders, and now heading into kickoff in a few hours, I'm super excited to watch the Raiders because I don't know if it, it could be anything from horrible to one of those teams that were all like, why didn't we draft more Raiders? So I, I think their range of outcomes is one of the largest in football. It's fun because also the Panthers on the other side and Teddy. Uh, but but if the Raiders' offense doesn't look good this week, then we'll, we're back in a way uh, <laughs> because true. you know New England, New Orleans, and Buffalo coming up the next three weeks, and also uh, you know everything's there for Carr now. Offensive line, Marcus Mariota's on IR, so he doesn't even have to feel that pressure of looking over his shoulder. This is actually a Derek Carr week. You might be thinking of Derek Carr over a quarterback that you drafted to start, like Matthew Stafford. Uh, and maybe it is a Derek Carr week. It is one of the fun early games. Gene, maybe not a fun early game. Not fun to be a Bears fan as Mitchell Trubisky backs into the starting quarterback job, although he has had three three touchdown games. It shocked me when I saw that. Three touchdown games. Three times already in his career against Detroit. Uh, but uh, David Montgomery. David Montgomery's going to play. David Montgomery's going to get his full load. Is David Montgomery in your lineup, Gene? 
Yeah, I, I guess I'm still skeptical about the full workload. Um, you know, I think this was probably, and and the reporting on this was a little bit overly concerning from the beginning, maybe because of the video reaction to his injury and knowing that there was a pretty significant groin situation. I, we've talked about this, depending on the injury, the muscle involved, when we say groin, there's there's a bunch of areas there, whether it's more in the, I mean, they're all technically core abdomen, but more up towards the belly versus more down towards the leg. And if it's a groin injury in the leg, there's so much redundancy in that musculature that usually if the, the initial injury, the swelling, the bleeding, the pain, the range of motion, once that's gone, players can return maybe a little bit more quickly than, say, you think with a hamstring or a, um, or a calf or sometimes even a quad muscle. So I don't think it's all that unusual that he was able to come back. It just seems surprising that things turn so quickly through the week. But... Um, you know, maybe this was the Bears angle all along that they just wanted to have him stretched out and make sure everything was okay on Wednesday and then ramp him up. The full practices are reassuring, but I don't know that I'm ready to expect 20 plus touches for him today. Tarek Cohen is there. The Bears offense is, we're not really sure what we're going to get from it today. Um, the game script being what it is, it's hard to know exactly what's going to happen with the Bears and their offense. So uh, this is a really good sign that we're probably likely to get that 15 touch mark from him that puts him in a running back two category, maybe even a little bit better, but I don't, I don't know that there's a ton of upside with him. And also thankfully um, at this point with the reports that we've seen wouldn't necessarily say that he's at high risk of aggravation, hopefully he gets through this game and then it's full systems go from week two onward. And Gene next week, take, take your time machine into next Sunday when we do the show. Are we going to be talking about Kenny Galladay as a game time decision? Are we going to be talking about him full go? What do you think? Yeah, I, Wednesday is going to be important. You really hope that he's on the practice field on Wednesday or we, you know, I was going to, I was about to say that we get a reassuring note from Matt, Patricia and the Lions, but that's not going to happen. We're not <laughs> going to get much from Detroit. We never do. So we're going to be relying on practice participation. It's not a, a um, highly reported team either. So yes, I think of all the players that we're talking about this week, Kenny Galladay is the one at the highest risk, assuming there's no aggravations from the players that may be active today, despite injury. Galladay is the one that we have to be most concerned about for week two. All right, Jason, let's uh, go on some of the hot button fantasy issues from this Chicago Detroit game. How much are you contorting to get Marvin Jones or TJ Hawkinson in your lineup or in your DFS lineups this week with Galladay out against the Bears? The guy, you know, Robert Quinn, Khalil Max a little banged up. There's a suspect corner, a suspect safety. So you can play this either way. Sure. Well, you probably can guess my answer, given that I, I think I am the <laughs> official licensed <laughs> torchbearer of TJ Hawkinson. So, um, you know, I pounded the table on him all preseason. So I'm going to live or die by that one. And with uh, I couldn't have asked for better news with Galladay being out in week one. Right. So, yeah, I'm all in on Hawkinson. I, I own him in an insane number of redraft leagues and dynasty leagues, and he's in my lineup for most of them. Uh, in DFS, again, just for your listeners that don't know me as well, I'm not a, I do not profess to be a DFS expert. I am a casual passive DFS sure. player. But that said, uh, Hawkinson is in my cash, my main cash lineup this week for sure. Marvin Jones, just the opposite. Um, and it's just a byproduct of I don't, I don't have Marvin Jones on a single roster this year. Um, that didn't necessarily have anything against him at his ADP. He just wasn't someone that I ended up targeting. I was looking for other positions at that spot. And so it's just not a decision I have to make. I have very little Galladay and no Jones. So really the only decision for me was DFS. And for me, that's Hawkinson. And then Put it this way. Yeah. Sorry. But, but if, if Hawkinson doesn't have a great week, then um, I may be a very sad torch. Bear. Sure. No, this is one uh, where Hawkinson had a great week one last year. And again, a glass half full, glass half empty. He got six red zone targets in five games or seven in five games, but he only converted one to a touchdown. So you, it's kind of like the Edwards Hilaire six goal line carries on Monday night is a positive or negative. On the Chicago side, uh, Jason, are you putting any stock in Mitchell Trubisky actually being good against the Lions consistently? Um, you know, I get some questions with Anthony Miller. Uh, is Are you somewhat optimistic that at least for this week, the Bears fans suffering will be put on hold? Well, similar, similarly, we, we all know that Trubisky, it was very logical that Trubisky would get the week one start, right? Because if you go with Foles in week one, you're pretty much saying you've given up on the kid, right? So even if it was a dead heat and neither of them took the job and ran with it, it made sense that they would give Trubisky the shot. But I don't know that the coaches have, we shouldn't read that as being that the coaches are very confident right. in him. Um, I wouldn't, I mean, certainly I would think that, that nobody should be in the position of having to play Trubisky, even in super flex leagues. I would imagine 
Trubisky was your QB three if you took him. So I wouldn't confidently put him in any uh, non DFS type of situation. And then with DFS, there's so many inexpensive quarterbacks that uh, I'm just, uh, this is a watch and wait. And if for some reason you have Trubisky at the end of your bench, you hope to see a good game this week. I mean, from a matchup perspective, I believe Okuda is unlikely to play, yeah. right? Yeah. So, um, and, and certainly with, with the Eagles acquiring Darius Slay, Okuda was supposed to be that piece that plugged and played into that number one spot. Uh, he, he I, I like the player from college, but again, he's not in this week. So it, it this should be a week where if Trubisky has any claim on the job beyond a few weeks, he shows it, but I, I have no confidence in it. Gene, you got to love the old school coaches. Vic Fangio. Do some jumping jacks. You can do some jumping jacks. You can play. Uh, all right. I mean, he was probably playing with the yank in our chain a little bit, but you got to make decisions that revolve around Cortland Sutton's availability, even though it's Monday night today. Uh, what's the best guidance you can give us on whether Sutton will play and whether he'll be effective if he does play? Yeah, it kind of sounds simple that all you have to do is 10 jumping jacks, but I can that, do 10 jumping you know, jacks. That goes to, well, you don't have potentially a collarbone <laughs> that's poking up away from your shoulder. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, basically he's saying if he shows that he's got a little bit of strength, a little bit of endurance, uh, and a lot of range of motion that they'll allow him to play. And, uh, you know, as we talked about on Thursday night, having this injury on Thursday, 72 hours before game time, significant enough that an exam and maybe an x-ray causes enough concern to want to grade the injury with an MRI that same day makes you wonder that whether this is a um, you know a, a mild and short-term injury now NFL players getting 16 chances a regular season will pad and do different forms of pain management and do whatever they can to get out there but despite all those things if you take another hit on that area it's going to be sore and tender I, I think the trends would suggest that there's a good chance that he's going to play honestly and truly. If it is as simple as show me that you can move your shoulder, we're going to allow you to play if you want to, then I think he's likely to go. We're putting in the same you know, analysis here as we would be with Mike Williams, although it's been a longer period of time with a higher grade injury from Williams, which is as simple as it's not necessarily snap to snap, but it's very much series to series. He may have to sit out from time to time. He might not see a full complement of snaps and therefore a full complement of targets. Um, hard to know. Drew Locke, Jerry Judy, uh, Melvin Gordon, a lot of new moving parts in the Denver offense. Um, but uh, knowing that Drew Locke and Cortland Sutton had a pretty good connection toward the end of last year, if he's on the field, I think you can trust him to get enough targets to, to, you know, maybe not what you expected when you drafted him, but to be productive. But I think if you do that, if you do go that route and you're anticipating and playing, you absolutely have to have an hedge on the roster so that you can pivot if you need to on Monday night. So uh, that's a hard one to, He's every bit of game time decision. I don't think the Broncos are playing with us in that regard um, because of the injury and the, and the timing of it. There's definitely a chance that he'll be inactive. But if he goes, I think you can probably trust him to get enough targets to be productive. Doc, um, I've seen a lot of people, especially fellow Eagles fans, worry that putting these receivers out there with these shoulder injuries too soon somehow runs the risk of if they take one bad hit, they could be out for an extended period yet all these teams seem to be leaning towards letting these guys play if they have the pain threshold to do so. So can you just kind of discuss whether or not there is a significant risk of re-injury if they're out there too soon? Yeah, there's two separate injuries, I think, that we've mm -hmm. seen with wide receivers this preseason. One is the shoulder dislocation, which leads to a labral tear, potentially some short and long-term issues. And players, if they have enough stability in their shoulder, may choose to play through it with a harness. And yes, that is a week-to-week. -week, not ex I mean, it is snap-to-snap, -snap, but it's not such a concern where, um, you know, it's going to be one play that puts them out for the season. Um but, you know, we can't predict what that snap is going to be. So, you know, the Tyrell Williams, Jalen Rager, that sort of crew is different than the Cortland Sutton, Mike Williams, so on and so forth, where the, the shoulder injury is outside the joint itself. It involves ligaments and it can be aggravated. But whereas if Rager has another issue, he is probably going to be shut down, have labral surgery, and that's a six-month recovery. If a Sutton or a um, Mike Williams takes a hit on that shoulder, you know, once the pain relaxes there, it's it's not nearly as likely that you're going to have a catastrophic where one ligament mild grade injury goes to a three ligament significant injury and a multi-week absence. Now, James Conner was a little bit of a different situation, just never seemed to be comfortable with that injury. And we don't know what the grade is. We don't know what the range of motion and strength is. So there is, in some respects, we could hear that one of these players with a shoulder separation, AC sprain, has an aggravation such today that they miss a couple of weeks, but that really should not be a season-ending aggravation in 
the same way that it would have been for Tyrell Williams and it could be for Jalen Rigger. And on the Sutton thing real quick, uh, Mike Kliss, who's close to the team, let's just say that there are certain beat writers that you learn, like when you hear something from them, they're close to the team, okay? I uh, said it's a decision between Sutton playing maybe at 60 Seventy-five percent and risking him staying there for longer versus him sitting, but then being eighty to ninety-five percent once he plays, and then uh, and he didn't say hundred percent because no one plays at hundred percent, so he wasn't saying that Sutton would be limited. So what, what do you think of that yeah, analysis? That's, that's reasonable, right? So we know anytime you hear a sprain, an AC sprain, there are three ligaments. It's not. I'm simplifying a little bit, but there are three ligaments that hold the collarbone to uh, the shoulder blade on the outside of the shoulder joint. And at least one of them has been damaged in some regard and possibly more. And I, I mean, I wasn't joking when I said, you should be able to tell if that collarbone is poking up like this, that one of those ligaments and possibly more of them have been damaged enough that you want to go see what's happening on an MRI. That is evident after you take off the shoulder pads um, and certainly on an X-ray, how much that joint is separated. So, and ligaments take time to heal, depending on the grade of injury, it could be a week or so where things are feeling pretty good. And maybe there's a little bit of leftover stress there, but the the, um, the joint space is mostly intact to that ligament was torn all the way and it's going to be weeks and weeks and weeks until it's fully healed. So every day that you go by without stressing the healing of that ligament, and we're not going to immobilize a shoulder joint um, in that way, then there's more interval healing that happens. There's less pain and range of motion issues, and there's less chance of aggravation. So yes, I mean, you know, my general feeling about trying to attach a percentage chance to how a player is feeling and, and what the risk of recurrence is, but it absolutely stands to reason that with every day that moves on and the inflammation settles and the healing that occurs, that there's less chance of a meaningful aggravation. Okay, Jason, we've got like 20 minutes left, so we'll try to go through like some lightning round stuff here, some takes or just some leans. Um, with Sutton limited, potentially out, maybe it matters, maybe it doesn't matter. Jerry Judy, you might not have drafted to start. Do you find a way to start him in light of this? Judy, Judy, Judy. Mm. Uh, absolutely. Why not? Um, mm -hmm. You know, listen, we all are we all are um, subject to the Cecil Lammy siren song. And yep. hopefully he's not bringing us into the rocks. But uh, Cease said Judy was maybe already better than Sutton. I, I, Judy was a target. I'm sure I wasn't alone. It was my – I worked every dynasty – angle I could to make sure I was in a position to draft him as my first round pick. Uh, big believer in him long term. He and CD Lamb were the guys I saw as can't miss of this class. So yeah, I, I'm I'm he's in a couple of my lineups to your point. Um, in two of the leagues that I have Mike Evans, I also had Judy thankfully, so he's gonna go in for him. Um, but uh, sure I, I like the matchup and um, you know I, I realize there's some risk in putting rookie receivers out there in week one, particularly in a off season like we just had with the pandemic, but uh, but I'm sometimes you have to be bold and venture forth, and and I'm happy to have Judy out there this week. Uh, is, is the answer Melvin Gordon, Philip Lindsay, or none of the above? I I I've always been a fan of Melvin Gordon. I understand that Philip Lindsay looked great in camp, and he's got a chip on his shoulder, and it will probably be a maddening committee. But um, I mean, we've already seen Gordon in a committee, right? I mean, he was in a committee for much of his time in, in as a charger and was still a highly effective fantasy back. And I'm going to presume because they just paid him a lot of money and targeted him that he will be the goal line guy. And so as long as he gets a touchdown or two, um, he's going to be better than Lindsay. So I, I, I would, if I don't know why people would have both, maybe you drafted both, but that's unlikely. I, I would be happy putting Gordon in my lineup for sure. And I wouldn't be mad at Lindsay in PPR formats, although I know Lindsay's not a great receiver per se, but I, I just would prefer to at least have, like the only narrative I can see where Lindsay and Gordon are every week plays together is that is that Lindsay evolves into a third down specialist, and so I think there's risk there. So I wouldn't love the idea of having Lindsay in my lineup this week, but if you do, uh, it better be as your flex. Gene, while we're on this game, it, I'd love the chance to be educated or at least sound educated from all the time I've spent with you whenever I talk about injuries. But we have a new one with Von Miller. It sucks. Perianeal tendon. Perineal. Perennial, perennial. Uh, tell, hopefully, it's get, not perennial. Or, yeah, hopefully, it's not <laughs> perennial. What happened? You can you give us just a little insight for our uh, physiology, anatomy, education? And there's a ligament from one of the leg muscles that travels behind the outside of your ankle bone, 
and ends on kind of the, the back end of one of your foot bones there. And something must have happened where he got twisted or, you know, an unusual position and that ligament flipped over the top of the bone. And when that happens, it can be you know, obviously stretched and that little area is unstable so that the, you know, everything that, that functions there does not function as well. Is an unusual injury. I'm not sure I've seen an example of it before. Haven't done a lot of research on it yet. There's some controversy, I wouldn't say controversy, but some discussion about whether or not this is truly season ending. The Broncos say that it absolutely is. Um, it's not something that's likely to require surgery from what I've been able to determine. So maybe if his rehab goes smoothly, knowing that this year's injured reserve rules are, um, have been relaxed enough so that anybody goes on can come off at any time after three weeks, the Broncos really don't have to make any other decision other than put him on injured reserve and see how things go and see how the rest of their season progresses. And if things go smoothly and we play all 16 games and they're in it toward the end of the year and the rehab has gone well after about three months or so, and he feels fine. Maybe they bring him back, but um, I think it's, you know, it's, there's every reason to suspect that we won't see him back in any sort of meaningful role until 2021. So Jason, with Vaughn Miller out, with Bradley Chubb, not 100% yet, is this a Johnny Smith week? Is this a Ryan Tannehill week? Is, is A.J. Brown, you probably drafted him to start, but, you know, you're, you're setting, you're trying to get your big hitters for the DFS. What do you think about the Titans passing game tomorrow night? Yes to it all. Uh, again, I it's week one, so I can't imagine that Ryan Tannehill is is your QB one. Um, and I wouldn't just because of the aforementioned injuries, I wouldn't be rushing to swap Tannehill in because of the matchup. I I I should say I'm generally against this idea of getting too cute with playing the matchup in week one. I think you play the guys you drafted to be your starters in week yep. one because we don't really know much about the opposing defenses either. Um, and again, I, I don't think many leagues are set up where you drafted Tannehill as your starter. So I wouldn't be rushing out to play him, although I I, I don't have any issues with, with him this week. I think he'll do just fine. Uh, I think that um, Johnny Smith is one of, I don't know, three or four tight ends that are this year's uh, let's hope we struck gold. Uh, I'm not... I'm not necessarily on the Johnny Smith train in the sense that if you look at Delaney Walker, he, he isn't Delaney Walker doesn't have Travis Kelsey ceiling. You know, he, he, I don't, I don't think he even, even at his best, he wasn't that good. And I don't know that Johnny Smith is as good as Delaney Walker in his prime. So I, I see Johnny Smith as a guy that if he pans out for you, he's giving you that tight end seven through 10 value each week, which isn't all that great. I mean, that's, that's just a shade above waiver wire pickup and hoping for a touchdown. So I'm really not super excited about any Titans this week, other than the two you certainly drafted and intended to play every week, which are of course, Derek Henry and AJ Brown. Yeah. Henry could be incredible. And with Smith for folks out there thinking about Smith, um, Denver is always terrible defending the tight end. It only takes one play with Johnny Smith. So that's a fun, exciting well, play. Go ahead. They've always been terrible, but that doesn't mean they're going to be terrible this year. True. Although right. um, they released Todd Davis before the season. Um, I'm not even sure. You know, Justin Strad, they drafted as a – they. oh, they signed Mark Barron. Gene, yeah. they signed Mark Barron. Do you, do, yeah. you want the, <laughs> do you want the guy that Mark Barron is trying to – you're nodding along. What's your Mark Barron analysis to get your defense side of the ball here? I don't think the Broncos really have a, a strong sense of what they want to do at linebacker. I think they realize that Josie Jewell probably isn't the option. No. Um, and none of these guys are going to be every down situations, whether it's – Sternad or Barron or Jewel probably over the long term. So it's going to be a mismatch if and when Todd Davis can get back. Yeah, it's probably good that there won't be fans in Denver because then they won't have to hear. <laughs> the they traded for Austin Calitro too. Oh, he's they did. Just, yeah, yeah. He's in the so that's where, they're, and they're going to, and, and and they're also in a desperate situation at edge rusher. They talked to Cameron Wake. They're going to do something uh, at edge rusher. So it's not a great week for the Denver defense. Okay, uh, Gene, real quick uh, on tomorrow night's note, Golden Tate. There was some talk that he wasn't one hundred percent. He had a hamstring coming in to week one. Um, whether or not he plays, do you have any insight for Golden Tate and then how that affects all the other lineup decisions for the Giants? I don't think there's too much concern. We're still waiting to hear exactly how Joe Judge is going to approach the media, but he seemed to be pretty reassured that things were progressing nicely. They didn't have too much concern with Tate kind of in the veteran category who didn't need to be on the field all the time to make them comfortable with him being in their game plan. So who knows how things are going to break down um, in New York, you know, so many unanswered questions without a lot of the off season to go to there, but I don't have any concern that he's going to be inactive. I should, I expect him to play. Jason looking at the giants, of course, you know, keep your enemies closer. Uh, the, the giants passing game 
Sterling Shepard, Evan Ingram, a, another tight end you might be looking at here. It is the Steelers' defense. Sorry, Daniel Jones. I hope Jason Garrett doesn't make him think too much when he's out there because he won't have time to think before getting run over. Uh, any Giants passing game plays you like tomorrow night? Uh, yeah, listen, I, I think that uh, Daniel Jones, unlike um, some, like a Tannehill, he is probably someone that some teams drafted as their intended starter. You waited on quarterback. You you did the late late round QB thing. Jones is is either one of a tandem that you're looking to start, or or the guy you, you drafted as number one. So, um, but but like you said, it, this is a this is a case where uh, I know I just said you don't want to get too cute with your matchups. Yeah. I, I but the Steelers because of what they were last year and that most of their pieces are back, one must presume that the Steelers defense is going to be one of Daniel Jones's tougher matchups. Um, also, as the guy as you know, Sig who covers the NFC East beat for us and, and does the training camp reports in a year where every beat writer was just trying to exude positivity on a, on a level that we, we were used to seeing, but even more so. And, and every beat reporter said everybody looked great. Jones's training camp was, was up and down. Um, and, and one of the things that is really disturbing is in their white and blue scrimmage. Um, he got sacked a bunch of times and sacked in meaning he would have been sacked. And he right. also, had a strip fumble, which looked exactly like it did last year, where he just doesn't take care of the ball. He keeps the ball low. So I'm wondering if it's just same old Daniel Jones. So if you're in a league that penalizes turnovers, uh, I would be very, very reticent to have him as my starter in week one. If you're in uh, a league that has a more simplistic soaring system or, or just doesn't give negative points for things like interceptions and fumbles lost, I don't know why it would be. But if you are, then he's probably okay. In terms of the receiving uh, options, I'm fine with Evan Ingram. Um, I think he's a bit of a paper tiger, but I, I, he had a good camp, and I have no issues if you drafted him as your starter. You're likely putting him in, and that's fine. And then among the trio of of receivers that we're dealing with, as you know, I have been um, more inclined to like Sterling Shepard. He was very, very good this this summer. Uh, the most consistent player, I think, offensively at any position other than Saquon Barkley. And so I think if if they all stay healthy, which is a huge if certainly, but if they'll stay healthy, Sterling Shepard, I think will be the, the best of the three from a, uh, a redraft perspective. Gene, can you show us your utter lack of surprise that Debo Samuel's put on IR? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was a little bit confused. I didn't realize that there was a provision in the off season rules that, that said that certain injuries weren't allowed to be put on the active roster to activate a player from PUP or NFI and then move them to in-season IR because I thought that was going to be a routinely used situation where, you know, why would you have somebody there for six weeks if they were close and then uh, and then not use the ability to, to bring back folks in three weeks um, with uh, with impunity? So, no, I'm not surprised at all. I think we were always targeting kind of the middle of September for his ability to play. I didn't think that, that, that the PUP was a likely option because he was going to be ready to go well sooner than six weeks into the season. But it's also no surprise that he wasn't ready for anything meaningful in week one. And although the Niners wide receiver depth chart is a mess with all the issues that they've had again this off season, um, you know, there, there wasn't any chance that they were going to push him to play in any meaningful way in the first couple of weeks of the season. And because it's 2020 gene, I know that you don't have any training in like environmental science and things like that, but we're talking about air quality and it does intersect with the medical angle here on Tevin Coleman, which also could affect your Raheem Moster decisions or depending on how deep your league is. Jarek McKinnon, it does look like as of right now, Santa Clara and Inglewood, the air quality uh, is below 200, which is a good thing. Uh, so it does look like the games are on. But what about Tevin Coleman being on the field uh, having to do with the sickle cell trait and air quality? Yeah, I think thankfully we're hearing that you know, at least whether it's the winds have shifted or things are improving a little bit in the San Francisco area, that that air quality looks significantly better than it was projected to be as of Thursday or Friday. So that's a great sign, hopefully for more folks than just those around the, the stadium itself. And anything that puts Tevin Coleman's system under stress, be it altitude, be it injury, be it something like an air quality issue, puts him at a little bit higher risk. So um, it, it looked like Kyle Shanahan was being mindful um, and allowing everybody to know after Coleman didn't practice on Friday, Friday, that there was a chance if things continued this way that he wouldn't be able to play and rightfully so but um, things have been since yesterday morning leaning towards Coleman's likely to go and, and I haven't seen any indication that that there's going to be a shifting situation such that Coleman makes a last minute decision to hold out this week. 
any hes- hesitation, Gene, if folks wanted to play Brandon Ayuk this week, any hesitation with the hamstring? Yeah, um, I-, I think so. We'd been really hearing some positive things, and then Thursday was, well, maybe we're hedging a little bit. Uh, and then Kyle Shanahan essentially said on Friday, we're not sure that we're going to need to activate a wide receiver off the practice squad, and everything we just said holds about the wide receiver depth chart being a bunch of unknowns. And putting Debo Samuel on injured reserve made it that much easier for the team to, you know, they just opened up a roster spot to bring somebody up. So the fact that they didn't do that almost certainly means that Ayuk is going to be active. Doesn't mean that he's going to move through pregame warmups well and and be more than just a, you know, a, getting some token usage in the Niners offense. Hard to say, but um, you know, I'll leave that to you guys to decide whether or not there's enough other options there. I think there's enough between running back and tight end that you know we're not expecting Ayuk to approach double digit targets no matter how well the first couple of weeks of camp went for him before the injury. So um, I'm I'm comfortable saying he's going to play. I'm not nearly as comfortable saying he's going to get enough snaps to be effective. Okay, just a few minutes, Jason. So we're going to do like lightning round where you just, it's like the temperature, okay? You're warm, you're hot, you're lukewarm, you're cool, you're cold. And like we said, and I'm with you because Cecil's got the Marcy Rossman rule that's like for the December games, dance with who brung you. But I said dance with who you went to the dance with in week one. You know, you showed up with your date. At least take the first dance with your date. That was what I said earlier. Right, otherwise, so why did you draft them? Yeah. Exactly. So I'm with you. But, but you know, whether it's injuries, replacements for guys like Mike Evans and Cortland Sutton, or just, I mean, fantasy football is supposed to be fun. Sure. And playing rookies in week one can be fun or playing someone that you really like uh, because of the matchup or, or just because of what you've been hearing about them. So let's just do some uh, lightning round on uh, you know, the temperature. LaVisca Chenault. Yeah, not not interested this week. Uh, like him very much as a player. As you know, I'm a Colorado Buffs fan yeah. in, in as much as that such a thing exists these days. Uh, but he's, he's oft injured, got banged up at the end of camp. And I'm not very high on the Jaguars having positive game scripts most weeks. So need to see it first, but happy to have him on my bench. What about Antonio Gibson? Yeah, very much skeptical of Gibson vaulting into the top 20, 25 and ADP like he did after the Peterson news. But this week, like him a lot, especially in PPR formats. Zach Moss. Yeah. Uh, Definitely a flex play. He is my flex in a number of 14 team leagues, but I think we have to be realistic and understand that we're going to be very reliant on him plunging in for touchdowns. Chris Herndon. Wait and see. Feel like it's the 17th year in a row that Herndon's been, been touted right, as right. a, as a breakout <laughs> tight end. Uh, but that being said, looking at what Darnold has in the alternative for targets, uh, he should have a, an auspicious start. If he doesn't have a good week, Week one and week two, then you're probably going to drop them for the hot wafer pickup. Right. That's a good thing to get the early reveal. Gene, real quick, um, Creston Williams, Devontae Parker, Mike Kosicki, glute. I haven't seen glute on the injury report for a while. Uh, <laughs> the largest muscle in your body. Uh, Gene, not on the injury report, these Miami guys. Now, it is a tougher matchup against New England. It's not last year's New England defense. Uh, anything you want to add to the outlook for these guys? Uh, if we have a good sense of who Stefan Gilmore is going to cover more often than not, I might be a little bit more concerned, but I, the news on Devonte Parker seemed pretty good. Preston Williams, we've been up and down about whether or not that knee's an issue, but both of them have participated in training camp with very little restriction. And I would expect them to be again, whatever you think of Ryan Fitzpatrick against the new England offense or defense rather is, is how I would progress from there. I think that they're going to run Jordan Howard a lot. I think you run. You run at New England. You run at New England until they prove they can stop it because uh, the, the defense is a donut right now. But what about the Miami passing game? Woodrow, are you dabbling in Dolphins? Uh, not this week, no. Uh, but that being said, in, in in our staff league, I drafted Fitzpatrick uh, as one of my quarterbacks because mm-hmm. it, it, it seems as though Tua, uh, while he's certainly the future there, had as disappointing a training camp as, as he could have had. In other words... There's no reason to think, based on uh, the fact that he was essentially outplayed by Rosen, uh, by most beat writer accounts, that he's ready to push Fitzpatrick, even if they're right. losing games. So I'm assuming you're getting at least eight games of Fitzpatrick. And we know that dude runs hot. When he's hot, he's mm-hmm. 350 yards and three touchdowns. It may be three picks, too, but but uh, he runs hot. Yeah, it's going to be fun. What about on the other side of that matchup, Jason? Uh, Cam Newton and his targets, James White, Julian Edelman. Are you wait and see, or are you optimistic? It's weird that we would even consider the Patriots a wait and see, right? I mean, right. we're so used to them being the thing that you can you can set your clock to. But uh, listen, I am skeptical of Newton, not buying into the Newton thing. So I'm I'm a I, I'm a I'm from 
the show me state. I'm from Missouri. You need to show me. But <laughs> but that said, um, listen, I, I think there's no reason you, you – James White should be in your lineup this week if he's why, – why wouldn't he be, right, based on what we've seen from the other running backs, Damien Harris is on IR, which which crushes my soul because I have him in a 1,000 leagues. Um, Sony Michelle seems like he's actually coming out of uh, – like all see, all summer we thought he was pretty much a wash, and then he – suddenly started practicing and he he may in fact lead the team in carries this week it looks like but but yeah i think james white why won't james white catch 80 90 balls this year uh, given that they have no other receivers now Nikhil harry's a go i believe i believe yeah. he's gonna Gene, play anything on harry nothing concerningly no i think we're fine so what about harry go ahead jason sorry no, I was just going to say. So I'm I'm fine with James White in in PPR formats. He's he's I don't know that you can play him in 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 uh, non PPR. Uh, and then I would pass some of the other running backs, and I would not play Newton unless you're in a super flex league. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And the one reason that James White might not be a hit is Rex Burkhead, who uh, apparently was uh, riffing with Newton, oh. 15 to 17 targets. I know there's Rex Bur- Rex Burkhead is always there to mess things up for us. Gene, real quick, I'm going like a minute or two over. I want to make sure to try to be comprehensive for our people out there. Drivers Landry, yellow flag or green flag? No, I mean yellow-ish. I think he's telling us that he's banana not colored ready. flag. Sure, he's, he's. I mean, he's telling us that he's not ready to go yet. They weren't concerned enough him, for him not to be on the injury report. Means that he's not getting any additional treatment during the week in the training room. Otherwise, he would have needed to be listed. Maybe we find out that the Browns skirted the rules there a little bit. But so that's a reassuring thing. But it, Landry has always been a little bit ahead of schedule, so it's really not surprising for a nine to ten month recovery of a surgery that happened in January that he's not quite feeling full strength yet. I don't think that's the concern. Um, and when he was fighting through this injury last year, when he would before the surgery, there was a period of time where he was only seeing 50 to 60 snaps, but he was still getting six to eight targets, not his usual double digit situation. Um, I don't think there's a particularly low floor here. I don't think he's telling us that he's not feeling well. So, you know, kind of expect six to eight target range, decent play, uh, and for him to get better as the season progresses. Last parting shot, Jason. And I know now that even as it pains you that you're on a Super Bowl pick, Cowboys, uh, Colts. That's my Super Bowl pick, but I know that you're favoring the Cowboys. What about CD Lamb and Michael Gallup tonight against the Rams? Sure. Uh, I think all, as I, as I mentioned too, when we were on the couch together, all three are likely to be, I think, very, very productive for a full year basis. Uh, we know that that injuries happen. It's a, it's a war of attrition. All, I think all three receivers will, uh, if one of them is out, the other two will be must starts. This this week, uh, I would comfortably play any Cowboys receiver. Now, at least one of the three is probably going to disappoint, but I I don't know that you can figure out who is who. I, I think Lamb could have a surprising snap count and target share this week, um, and and I I have no. I have no educated way of saying who's going to be the odd man out. So I would I would comfortably play all three if I if I drafted them. I agree. You want to get uh, your Cowboys on the field this week. We're glad to be back on the field for you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Uh, the 300 plus here during the live show. Thank you to Mitch again for giving us some DFS insight. Always stuff from the good doctor. I hope that you're not inundated uh, next week, Gene. Uh, and, and so happy to be joined by Jason Wood here on Sunday mornings, giving us insight. Football's back, and it will give us some sucker, some comfort, uh, maybe until we start seeing how our lineups are doing. But that's okay, because that's still why we're here, because it immerses us, because it engages us so much, because you engage us, folks. Thank you again for the opportunity to do this another year, and may we still be doing this in December. Uh, So everybody out there, stay safe, uh, and uh, uh, hope for Sally to dissipate it's not going to happen though so we'll see about that but we're all going to be doing everything we can at football guys to get you into the winner's circle so folks as always we love you stay classy